So I love how I um, was the administrator of the Desert Mountain Selfa, Desert Mountain Charter Selfa, Desert Mountain Children's Center for over 20 years. And in the last year, I have been a full-time grandpa. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and my, I started to say full-time husband, but my wife is actually here. So she would say, there are times when you're not with me full time. So it's that whole, anybody see Ruth Payne's presentation in the nothing box? Yeah, I got a very large size of one of them. So, so that's so true. All right, so what I want to talk to you about this afternoon is a little bit about trauma-informed instruction. Dr. Powell, that microphone is not on. It's not on. Now it is. Now it is. All right. Okay, so what you're telling me is I have to be in love with the mic. Okay, how's that? Good. All right, I'm going to talk about trauma-informed instruction uh, this afternoon, and um, and I call this going down for the third time the life-saving impact of a responsive instruction. And when I saw that title, it occurred to me that that probably has as much to do with teachers as it does with children. Because if you are anything like me, and I spent uh, eight years in the classroom uh, before I went into administration, I entered into teaching thinking that the world would be wonderful, that students would be so enthralled with the wonderful knowledge that I had to, trans, uh, to give to them, that uh, they would sit in rapt attention. <laughs> Uh, I had um, this idealistic notion that the bond that you create with a student was something very special. And like any first year teacher, that lasted for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and I suddenly realized that there was a whole lot that I didn't learn in my teacher education coursework. And my first year was probably the worst year in my life. Um, I started teaching in September, I got married in November, and that wasn't the reason why it was the worst year of my life. <laughs> in fact, my wife was actually the only thing that kept my head above water in that first year of teaching, and she will tell you that she witnessed mental health disorder in that first year. My nothing box was on from the time I got home until the time I went back to school the next morning as I would sit in my big chair, chain smoking cigarettes, and watching Captain Kangaroo. <laughs> At that point, uh, truck driving, logging, anything was better than teaching. And it was because I was totally unprepared for dealing with the type of uh, behavioral problems that I saw coming through the door. And that's what I want to talk to you about because you all are on the front lines. And you know that the two pictures that I showed before this are not the reality. See, you are aware of the demographics that we're facing in the Inland Empire area where two thirds of all the students that come through the door are students of poverty. And in addition to that, you have the issues of, um, you have Teenage pregnancies, you have, which means the lack of supports in the home. You have the issue that nearly one third of all babies born in the Inland Empire have been born having already been prenatally exposed to some kinds of substances. And they're bringing those issues into the classroom. The rate of maltreatment is one of the highest in the state of California. In addition to that, regardless of what grade level you teach, you see what you're getting. You've been to the supermarket. And if this one isn't coming to you in three years, you know that that same behavior problem, problem is going to show up in your classroom in 10 years or in 12 years. And yet we are responsible for taking children who come to us totally dysregulated and creating an environment where they learn to play nicely together and cooperate and they learn to be um, engaged in the enjoyment 
of the education that we have to give them. That's the reality of where we are in our classrooms today. Now, I'm here to talk a little bit about why we are where we are, and perhaps lead us around the corner to some of the things that we can do about it in the course of the next hour and a half. Now, I learned from Ruby Payne this morning that you can allow teachers to actually talk with one another and only give them 30 seconds and it's still okay. <laughs> Is this your experience? Turn to your neighbor. Is this what you're looking at in the classroom? Yeah. All right, so let's talk about stressful and traumatic events. And first of all, in order to start out, we have to talk about some definitions. See, we're all under a lot of stress. The real issue winds up being whether or not that stress is overwhelming to us, because stress can come in several different forms. The, the first is, of course, we have the positive stress that tends to be very temporary in its nature. It raises cortisol levels, which sends messages from our brain to the rest of our body. It increases the, the uh, adrenaline, our stress response, so our heart rate goes up. We're quickened a little bit, getting ready for whatever comes next. Cortisol is an amazing hormone. It actually increases your immune response but it also raises blood pressure. It cuts down on the size of your arteries so that if you get slashed by a saber-toothed tiger, you won't bleed to death immediately. You know, it, it signals adrenaline to be released from your uh, adrenal glands so that you're ready for fight or flight. So in a very stressful situation, the stress hormones can be very helpful. Sapolsky is a neuro researcher out of Stanford University. Anybody? heard any of Sapolsky's work, some of you. He wrote a wonderful book that was called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. See, the difference between humans and animals is that we all have the same stress response, but as soon as the stress event has passed, animals go back to normal. Human beings are the only mammal that's capable of creating a stress response strictly by thinking about it. You can create the stress in your mind. It doesn't even have to be there in reality. And when it happens that way, you, it's because you have experienced stress that perhaps is tolerable. It creates a more, um, a greater response in terms of the release of those stress hormones. But you are suffering by the supportive relationships that you're in. But what about those kids that come from homes that don't have supportive relationships to help them get through it? When that stress trigger goes off, they get this prolonged activation of that stress response, and now they don't have any resources to talk them through. It helps us to be around other people, people that we know care about us and love us, to pull us through those times when things are really tough. If you've been through a stressful event in your life, you know that it's helpful to be around people that you, that you feel have unconditional regard for you family members and others. You feel better about that. There are many children that come to us that don't have that in their lives. So here's, here's a continuum of what we call trauma. And like everything else, you know, it goes from the mild over to the severe. So you have acute events, that's like a single, that's a single event, you know, like a car accident, for example, that can create such a tremendous response that will last with you for a period of time. You have chronic, which includes multiple exposures over extended periods of time. You have complex, which is multiple events and multiple exposures. You have the most toxic kind, which is a strong, frequent, prolonged activation of the body's stress response system. And then you have the final category where it's actually secondary. In other words, we are stressed by observing others go through. This is what happens with intimate partner violence. So what is trauma? Quick definition is it's an exceptional experience in which powerful and dangerous stimuli has two parts. It overwhelms the ability of the body to respond to it. And the second part, you have insufficient resources to be able to cope with the event. So let's talk first about the biology of the trauma. Now Ruby talked a little bit about some of the biology. I'm going to go into that a little bit deeper, and then we're going to move on with how we see that in schools. The brain is organized um, bottom up and inside out, from the simple to the complex. 
The first part of your brain that actually forms in your period of development, you know, in utero, is what we call the brain stem, or sometimes called the reptilian brain. And it goes all the way up to that portion of the brain that we call the neocortex, that is the most complex part of your brain. It turns out that the brain stem, being that least complex part, it has to do with those functions of your body that you don't want to have to think about. Things like breathing and your heart beating, you know, things like the normal digestive system, all of that is controlled by your brain stem, whereas the neocortex, which is made up of well over half the neurons that are in your brain, the neocortex takes care of all of our rational, logical thought, our ability to weigh things against each other, that's all in the neocortex. If you look at it this way, you can see that each portion of the brain has its own separate function. Blood pressure, heart rate, body temperature, and breathing, all controlled by the brain stem. Whereas as we go up, the midbrain controls things like our arousal, our appetite, our sleep patterns. The limbic brain, or the emotional brain, controls attachment, sexual behavior, emotional reactivity, and motor regulation. And the neocortex controls our abstract thought, our concrete thought, and our ability to relate to one another, okay? The, the social part of our being. When we get upset, well, during normal activity, you're receiving input from the outside world, and then your body is processing that. And that processing takes place in the neocortex. But when we get upset, the neocortex shuts down. And all of the processing stops at the limbic level, which is the emotional level. Now think how this works in your own life. Have you ever, like for example, um, gotten into an argument? And by the way, the more significant the relationship is, the higher the valence, to use a chemistry term, the, the, the more there is at stake in getting into a disagreement. So for example, if you get into a disagreement with a, a guy who cuts you off on the freeway, that may raise your anger level significantly, and you may act very inappropriately. And I can guarantee you that when you do that, you are not acting that way because you are giving any kind of rational or concrete thought to the issue. You see how the neocortex cut off? All you do are, you're acting out of the anger. Okay? Notice that attachment, emotional reactivity, and motor regulation are all controlled by the limbic system. So what is your response? It's going to be some kind of motoric response, oftentimes, in addition to your anger. Now what if, if, you, if you are in an argument with a spouse, or with a child, somebody with that emotional attachment is already stronger than the levels of the stress go up even higher because you actually care what they think about you, you see. That increases the level of response there for the limbic system. Now, if we look at the way that that works in the brain, um, Bessel van der Kolk, it's a mouthful, Bessel van der Kolk has written a wonderful book. I recommend it to anybody, it's very readable. He's a, a psychiatrist um, out of Harvard. He wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Bessel van der Kolk talks about two portions of the brain that he calls the smoke detector and the watch. And so let me talk to you about the smoke detector and the watch. The first one is the smoke detector. You've already heard the technical term for it, Ruby talked about it this morning, and that is the amygdala. The amygdala is an almond-shaped little piece in your brain that has a very unique function. Van der Kolk calls it the smoke detector because the, the job of the amygdala is to receive any information that you get from the outside world. It's brought into the thalamus, right there in the middle, that kind of roundish structure. It's brought into the thalamus, and the thalamus then mixes all of that information that you get from the outside world. The, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the textures, all of that is mixed together. And that information, without judgment, 
is just given to your amygdala. And it's the job of the amygdala to make a determination as to whether or not that sensory input represents a threat or not. And if it represents a threat, then what does the amygdala do? It channels that information directly down to the brainstem. Remember, the brainstem doesn't have to think about anything. It just reacts, right? So we are pre-programmed, hardwired, to automatically react to things that are dark and big and coming from behind and loud. Can you imagine in our own evolutionary development how appropriate an automatic response to that kind of threat would be? I mean, believe me, if something is jumping out of the cave behind me, I don't want my body to think, hmm, I wonder what kind of saber-toothed tiger that would be in the I want my body to immediately respond. Now, when you're born in normal development, that amygdala is already online because survival becomes important to us immediately. And it's perceiving everything from the environment and making, a, and making a determination as to whether or not it's a threat. What happens for children with trauma is this traffic cop smoke detector role of the amygdala gets short-circuited because everything's a threat. For a child raised in a home of trauma, every sound could be a threat. And remember that your body is constantly picking up information. Ruby shared with you this morning that in any second, you're bringing in over 200 pieces of information through all of your senses. All of that is captured, by the way, in your right brain, which is the nonverbal portion of your brain. You can't put words to it, but your brain is perceiving those threats. Now notice where the amygdala is. The amygdala is positioned right directly next to the hippocampus. Now that's important because the hippocampus is not only the storage spot for short-term memory, it is the gateway to long-term memory. Ruby shared with you this morning that when memories are encoded along with strong emotion, they go directly into memory. Why is that? You need to know that, right? If that's going to be a scary thing for you in the future, you need to not forget that. You need to be able to respond to it appropriately. The proximity of the amygdala and the hippocampus is important because the amygdala sends the signals that actually triggers those stress hormones to get busy, to, to do its job of protecting. Now, can I share about startle reflex? Okay, I have to ask permission. You're about to clear this ahead of time. Okay. My, my, my wife was raised in an environment that was very stressful. And one of the first ways that I noticed that, you know, because before we got married, she was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Shortly thereafter, <laughs> we took a trip down Palmdale Road. For those of you that live in the desert, you know a couple of things already about that trip. It is a two-lane road. It has curves. You get behind big trucks and you go their speed because there's no place to get around. And if you do, you're taking your life in your right? It's kind of a scary road to be on. Don't go there at night. We did. <laughs> and up ahead, there was a big curve. And I recognized it, saw the string of lights kind of winding around like this. And I recognized that and saw that as being a curve in the road. My wife saw that, and all she could see was, there are lights directly ahead of me coming toward me, and they look like they're in our lane. And she launched. I'm, do you know what I mean when I say an overactive star reflex? It's like any loud noise or whatever, and it just launches you, right? For those of, that have been raised in a home environment where your body has depended on its survival, to be ready, like now, then you have an overactive sorrow reflex. I thought that was under rational control. So when she launched and screamed to high heaven, <laughs> it scared the pants off of me, and I have a very low threshold in terms of sorrow response. And, um, and so I responded to that, like, don't do that. 
Okay, so that's not a helpful response. Just a word to you. <laughs> Speaking from somebody who's been married 41 years, that is not a helpful response. There is no way in the world that Jackie can control the startle reflex. Why? Because the signal is being sent where? Down. It's being sent down to the brainstem, not up to the neocortex. She doesn't even have a choice in the matter. Her body is hardwired to go immediately to automatic response. That's where our kids are trauma. See? And all of that information that surrounded that trauma to begin with is still there, and it's stored in the right brain that has no words. So how does that make, how is that made manifest when a kid is triggered? It comes out in the form of images and sounds and emotional response and the triggering of hormones and you have absolutely no control. Now, the watchtower, and I know that would make you dizzy, so we'll get off of that. <laughs> the watchtower is the prefrontal lobe. The prefrontal lobe has a lot to do with our cognitive capacity. You know, it's the, it's the center of executive functioning, and one of the main uh, purposes of our executive functioning, which has to do with planning and organization and rational thought, it also has to do with where our working memory is. Your working memory is like your mental scratch pad. You take in information in short-term memory, you can hold it for about nine seconds and then it's gone, okay? But your working memory allows you to process that information. So I'm walking along the path through the woods, and I see this little brown thing, and it's along the path, and immediately my body thinks, is that a stick or is that a stick? That processing happens in the prefrontal cortex, okay? And I make a determination as to whether or not it is one or the other instantly. And I can respond appropriately. For a child whose messages from the amygdala is going straight to the brainstem, what do they do? They don't wait for it to be recognized. They jump, okay? Now, when the amygdala is overactive, it shuts down the prefrontal cortex. Your smoke alarm goes off, the watchtower, is, the watchman is asleep, okay? They never even get that information. So, so thinking that you can rationally, logically control an emotional response, folks, that doesn't happen. That won't happen. Telling a child to behave themselves once they've been triggered, that will not happen. There are other ways that you have to get to that, okay? But telling a kid to stop it isn't going to work. And we'll get to that. I'll show you more of that in just a minute. All right. When a baby's born, they are, of course, at their most vulnerable state. But they have one thing, one thing going on. They're cute. <laughs> Cuteness is directly correlated to survivability, right? A baby depends upon connecting with the mom by being cute. So the right brain begins to develop in the last trimester of development and continues its development through the first two years of life. By the way, when does language first start to appear? The second year of life which means that the right brain is fully developed before the left brain even starts to come online. All of the baby's relationships form in the right brain. The right brain is the center for empathy, it's the center for connection, and it's also the location of our mirror neurons. Our mirror neurons is the reason why you can smile at a baby and they will smile back. Okay, remember, their left brain isn't online. It's not reasoning, oh, if I smile back, I'll get, you know, food or whatever. <laughs> no, that isn't the way it works. They're smiling back because that connection that they are establishing with a caregiver is automatically happening through the right brain. Okay? Now, what happens if you have a child who is in a home, let's say, where there is substance abuse involved? or parental depression, so that mom is unavailable to meet the needs of the baby. What happens? The brain is wired for survival. It will do whatever it has to do to ensure that you survive as an organism. 
And in those circumstances where the mom is unavailable, attachment does not happen. We talked about different forms of attachment that was the experiments that were conducted by Bowlby. When attachment doesn't happen, or a child is, um, they're, they're made to feel like they don't matter, then what happens is empathy never develops. So um, Bruce Perry, in his book, um, Born to Love, he talks about a very affluent young man raised in a home of privilege in Chicago. His parents were both CEOs of companies. They lived in a huge house with all of the material things that you could imagine. They were part of the uber rich that uh, Ruby talked about this morning. And because they were wealthy, they were able to bring caregivers into the home to raise the children because mom and dad were both busy. But because mom noticed that the baby was becoming attached to the caregiver, then she thought, well, that's not right. I'm the mom. And so she fired the caregiver, and she hired another. And in the first two years of life, that child went through 24 caregivers. What happened to him? When the kid reached his senior year, his parents bought him a Cadillac Escalade for a, a graduation present. He invited all of his friends to come to his house for a big graduation party, including the girl who lived next door who had Down syndrome. She came to the party, and then he and several of his friends gang raped her. And when the parents ultimately found out and the police were called, he was dumbfounded why anyone would object to that. He absolutely couldn't imagine why he was being arrested. And his comment to the police was, I don't understand what the big deal is. She got more from us than she would ever get in her entire life. She would never have guys after her in the way that we gave her attention. Total lack of empathy. Why? He missed out in his first two years. You have kids like that that seemingly don't have any kind of connection, that seemingly like they don't have a conscience when it comes to relationships. They don't have feeling for others. You know, this all forms in the first two years, and attachment is at the root of that. So let me show you how that works. If we take a look then at how this works together, we have our brain area, we have the sense of time, and we have our sphere of concern. When things are calm, we're able to be in that very abstract world. Our brain is working with the neocortex. We're able to think of the future and of the past. We're able to put abstract concepts to our existence. Our sphere of concern can be very broad at that point, thinking of the world. But as pressures come in from the outside, it's pushing down from the top down in terms of the brain. And we're shifting from the neocortex now down to the cortex and the subcortex. Our thought patterns become much more rational and concrete, much less abstract. Our sense of time shortens now down to days and hours. And our sphere of concern also shrinks from the world down to community. This is what happens when you have deadlines that you have to meet. You get very focused, right? I'm not worried about vacation plans during the summer. I have a deadline next week. I have these plans set out for how I'm going to meet that deadline. They're very logical, sequential. See, that's rational, okay? What happens if the uh, <coughs> pressure continues? Now it's pushed down even further. As stress goes up, now my thinking is emanating from the limbic system in the subcortical area. My, my time span has shortened down into hours and minutes, and my concern has shrunk even more to only those people that I truly care about in family. And if the pressure then continues, and by the way, I will submit to you that you need to be aware as teachers when this stage hits, because your chance for intervention 
is going to go away pretty quickly if you get down any deeper than this one. Okay? <coughs> and I'll show you more about that in a minute. As the pressure and the stress continues, now we pushed it down into the living and the midbrain. Our sphere of concern turns into minutes and seconds, and our concern is about ourself. So can you think of circumstances like being in a fight, being in an argument? By the way, are you altruistic when you're in an argument? No. no. You're all about winning. It's all about the self at that point. And in the most extreme cases now, we're pushed all the way down to the brainstem. At that point, we've actually lost sense of time. People that are in near-death experiences will tell you that it seemed like time stopped. And you're concerned at that point only about your body and technique. This is the flailing part. What part of your body is in the automatic mode at the brainstem? It's your movement, it's your breathing, it's your heartbeat, okay? It's the things that you don't have any control over. My son went to the Air Force Academy and one of the um, um, experiences that he was allowed to have was learning to jump out of a plane uh, with a parachute. And they don't like ease you into it, you know, it's like not with a tether cord, not with a buddy friend, you know, no, you just go out the door and you're on your own. Well, they videotape. And as a dad, I got to see after the fact what that actually looked like as my son went out the side of an airplane at, you know, 20,000 feet or some ridiculously high altitude. And what do you think his first response was? The, yeah, no, not that. As soon as he went out of the plane, he was definitely in this body integrity mode because the only things that were working were his arms. It was as if he was flailing in the air. He was at such a point of terror that he couldn't tap into any part of the training that they had actually given him about how to handle that. And the, and the uh, cadet on the ground who's trying to coach him through the process, you can hear him say, arch your back, Nathan, arch your back. As if he could hurt, hear him at 20,000 feet, by the way. <laughs> but then the neocortex, then the rational part, you know, the brain began to waken up. Oh yes, and you could see then, as he arched his back and held his hands out and his arms out, and then eventually was able to pull the cord and the chute deploy. But that first instant, those first two seconds out of the plane, as a dad watching your son go into this body integrity mode, that, I went somewhere way down deep in <laughs> Remember that toxic stress can be caused by watching it happen in others, right? As well as it happening to you. So how did we get here? How do these significant emotional and behavioral health problems that we see every day in our school, how do they come about in the first place? I've given you a little bit about the, about the biology. Now let's talk about some of the prevalence. Alan Shore, the noted um, doctor at UCLA Medical School, is one of the premier researchers in right brain activity. And he made this statement, he says, neurons that fire together, wire together, and they survive together. For good or for ill, the way that neurons connect is through repetition. And if they're not used, then the body gets rid of them, thinking, well, you don't need that one, and it's gone. You go through significant periods of pruning as your brain becomes more efficient. Did you know that you're born with the capacity to produce every sound in every language known to man? That's kind of cool. Our brains come out of the womb pre-programmed to speak any language known to man, to produce any sound in any language known to man. Now, if you ever watched the National Geographic Channel, I'm sure that you have heard some languages spoken in some parts of the world, and you think, how in the world do they do that? The sound of grief in some Middle Eastern countries where it's almost like a warbling sound. Seen any of those things. We try in our Western culture, there's no way in the world that we can reproduce that. Why? Because the brain prunes. 
those neurons that were essential for that sound re reproduction. Ruby shared with you uh, this morning, or I went to both of her sessions, so she shared with you in one of the sessions this morning, the research that was done by Hart and Risley about the 30 million word gap between children of poverty and children of wealth. Well, Catherine Snow from Harvard University did a follow-up on that research, and she found it isn't just that we have a 30 million word gap. The words that are heard by children of poverty come from that casual language category that Ruby showed you in one of her charts. They come from the three to 500 most frequently used words in the English language. Now, what does that mean? Catherine Snow pointed out that that means that your brain is not exposed to, um, to what she called word neighborhoods. See, phonemes are unique aspects of sound. And so when a child is exposed to a vocabulary, they hear phonemes that are of a wide variety. So for example, if I were to say uh, the two words hall and ball, you would recognize that those two words differ from each other by a single phoneme. By repetition, children's auditory processing tunes into that subtle difference, that single phoneme. What about if I said pin and pen? Did you hear the distinction there? It's the difference between I and E. Did you know that 20% of the population cannot hear that sound? It's because they didn't hear it in those formative stages and the brain pruned the neurons that were necessary to get the distinction. So our neurons go through this period of time. If they're not used, they wind up being pruned. And in addition to that, when you put the overlay of stress, and the stress hormones are actually like pouring acid on nerve cells, and it winds up pruning them artificially. And so here you have an image of a neuron that's on the left that's normal, and one that's on the right that has been subjected to toxic stress. And you can see how much, mm, how many little dendrites and offshoots have been cut off of that. What do you think the end result is then of a brain that is subjected to stress? It's gonna have smaller volume, folks. And in fact, that has also been shown. The brain on the right is a child who died of severe neglect. It was one of the Romanian orphan babies, okay? Didn't have human contact, was raised in a crib by, the, by themselves, didn't have that social interaction. There was no reason for the brain to continue to expand through new connections because they weren't being used. And the brain takes note of that and it winds up reducing the volume. Stress reduces the volume in many parts of the brain. And what do you think the end result of that is? Developmental delay. And we'll show you that in a minute. See, stress winds up having consequences not only for our mental health, but also for our physical health, and that continues throughout lifetime. Maltreated children, 40 to 60% of them wind up having developmental delays compared with only 10% of the normal population. And those delays show up in areas like cognition, speech and language, which is a big issue that I just shared with you because they just don't hear those, the extension of those phonemes. It shows up in health problems, in motor delays, and in mental health problems. In fact, children who are the most significantly trauma-affected wind up very uncoordinated in terms of their motor development because the brain just hasn't made those connections. Child maltreatment has been associated with, I told you it's lifelong, 56% of adult psychiatric disorder is associated with childhood maltreatment. So it turns out that there are lots of opportunities for a kid to be stressed out. These opportunities extend throughout one's day, 24 hours a day. Now, we get attention drawn to the fact of the child abuse. You hear, oh my goodness, child abuse is terrible, you know, physical <coughs> abuse and sexual abuse. That actually winds up being about uh, one out of every 25 children are impacted by child abuse that has been substantiated, okay, by the child welfare system. But, it's about twice that number for children who actually suffer maltreatment in a home environment. Substance abuse and maternal depression affect about one in 10 children. And one in five children are impacted by violence in the home. Remember that you can suffer from toxic stress by watching it. 
They found that as many stress hormones are released during the observation or during the hearing of intimate partner violence as actually happens when a child is physically abused themselves. So seeing it happen to others is just as significant as it happening to the individual. So the study was done, Ruby referenced it, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, you know, where they found that um, what happens to a child prior to the age of 18 has lifelong impact on adult physical health, and it turns out that it's a leading cause of death in adults. So let me show you a little bit about that. The conclusion of the ACE study was that events leave a record, the brain is altered by those events, the nature of that alteration depends upon the nature of the events, and adverse events may alter development and lead to a lifetime of vulnerability. And by the way, this presentation is all on Line. You can download it. I know it wasn't uploaded until this morning, but you know it's it's there. Just because it wasn't done, <laughs> I had to get down into that whole body integrity level. You know. <laughs> so the A study was a large epidemiological study that studied 26,000 adults in the Kaiser uh, Health HMO uh, down in San Diego. They matched childhood experiences with adult health. They define 10 categories, and you don't measure events, you measure just by category. So here's examples. Here are four of the questions off the ACE study. Before the age of 18, did you live with someone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or who used street drugs? If the answer to that was yes, then you, that scored one. If the answer to that was no, then that was a zero, okay? Then were your parents ever separated or divorced because of marital problems? Uh, did a parent in your, by the way, 46% of the population should have a one on that one because that's the divorce rate among children of school age. Did a parent in your home ever swear at you, insult you, or put you down? Did a parent or caregiver ever fail to provide for your basic needs such as food, clothing, medical care, hygiene, or fail to protect you from known dangers? There were 10 in all. They addressed three aspects of what we would call abuse, psychological, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. Two in the area of neglect, emotional and, and uh, physical neglect. And then uh, five that had to do with household dysfunction. Alcoholism, the loss of a parent, depression, mental illness, domestic violence, or family member in prison. And as Ruby shared with you, a score of four or more turned out to be highly significant. What they found was, with a score of four or more, you were five times more likely to experience depression as an adult, uh, nearly 13 times more likely to be removed and placed in the child welfare system as a child, 12 times more likely to attempt suicide, seven times more likely to um, be an alcoholic as an adult, and you can see, three times more likely to have uh, greater than 50 sexual partners, and I would imagine that the next statistic, you know, nearly three times as likely to uh, have an STD uh, probably goes along with that previous one. And so if we take a look at how California is, here's California statistics. 38% have none. Hmm. Okay, so my math isn't all that quick, but that means 62% had one or more, right, of all Californians. 17% had four or more. In the national population, that's high. That's higher than the national population. National population is 13% have four or more. And among children of poverty, then the ratio is even higher. While pretty much similar for zero, one, two, and three, 20% of children of poverty have four or more, compared with 17% in California and 13% national. So it's almost twice as high as the national level. Can we see now how the presentation on the impact of poverty is totally related to now the impact of trauma, given the fact that most, or one out of every five children of poverty, not most, but one out of every five children of poverty also have A scores that are higher than four, that are higher than three. And when you look at that, you see an interesting pattern. Now what I want you to notice is how these bars are graded, meaning that the higher the ACE score, the greater the likelihood for teen pregnancy, drug use, depression, suicide, alcoholism, as well as health disorders like obesity, 
uh, heart disease, chronic bronchitis, and emphysema. See, the greater you're at risk as a child, the more your immune system has been compromised to these adult diseases. The more you wind up adapting, adopting behaviors that are meant for survival that wind up actually in the long term uh, working against you. The conclusion was the greater number of childhood traumatic exposures, the greater the risk of adult disease and death from any cause. And many chronic diseases of adulthood are actually caused by experiences that occur in childhood. Now, we run a clinic at Desert Mountain SELPA, the Desert Mountain Children's Center, in which uh, children are referred through the child welfare system. So when a child is removed from the home and they're referred to the SART clinic, that's about 50% of all of the kids that come into the SART clinic, and the other 50% come from the community. These children are all under the age of six. So now the question was, what's the incidence of adverse childhood experiences for that population? And we see that yes, indeed, compared with both the state of California as well as the national statistics, this population of children under the age of six are significantly more at risk. Remember that the original ACE study was under the age of 18. We're looking only at children under the age of six and already the, uh, per, the prevalence of children who have an ACE score of higher than three is twice as high as the national average. Moreover, we were surprised to see, we ran a separate program for children that were experiencing significant language delays. And when we looked at the ACE scores for those children who had significant language delays, we were startled to see that 60% of them had a scores higher than three. You see the impact that adverse childhood experiences is having on language development? And that was an aha for us. It may not always show up as a behavioral deficit, but it will affect the language center and the ability of the child to express their needs and their wants. So who's at higher risk for trauma exposure? Well, of course, young, the young, those living in poverty, which uh, disproportionately affects single moms, and ethnic minorities. And there are certain types of trauma, like sexual abuse and domestic violence, that then wind up being catalytic. They place a child at risk for more adverse experiences as well. <coughs> so what's the incidence that we see? Well, nationally, one in five children have a mental health disorder as a result of these experiences that is so significant that it's adversely their ability, adversely impacting their ability to live and to participate in school. And among children of poverty, it's uh, 30%. It's even greater than that. Children with emotional disturbance are li more likely to use alcohol, drugs, marijuana, and smoke. It's higher than any other category. They're more likely to be suspended, with two-thirds being reported having been suspended or expelled in any given year. And they're more likely to drop out of school, with 44% dropping out between the 9th and the 12th grade. Within four years of leaving school, 60% are involved in the juvenile justice system. They've been arrested at least once, and 39% are on parole. And research shows that 75 to 93% of all youth that are engaged with the juvenile justice system have experienced trauma. See how widespread this is? And these are the kids that are coming through your classrooms that you're being asked to work with. And yet, knowing those statistics, research shows that fewer than one in five will ever receive any type of mental health treatment. What does that mean? It means that we're creating a generation of kids that have a trajectory that goes from cradle to prison, not cradle to career. Who's going to do something about that is my big question. I mentioned before that a large number of kids are exposed to parental uh, violence. And the reason why that's a problem is because it primarily affects the really young children. Research shows that most of these kids that are exposed to intimate partner violence are under the age of six. Moreover, if intimate partner violence occurs before age six, that's a strong predictor of behavior problems later on in adolescence. Why is it? It's because when mom gets beat up, she gets depressed, right? 
and she doesn't talk to the child. And so the child winds up without like normal language models and without the attachment that they get from being close to mom and without their needs being met because mom is so depressed that she can't respond to that. Maybe she's self-medicating by taking drugs or drinking or some other way of being able to relieve the pain. Those kids who wind up being uh, raised by mothers who are depressed are much more likely to suffer from language delays, internalizing problems like anxiety and depression themselves, and you're going to see that when they approach adolescence because all of the other hormones come into place and that's where the brain begins to reconsolidate and try to make sense of it all and those mood disorders begin to appear. Campbell has estimated that between 10 and 15 percent of all typically developing preschool children have chronic mild to moderate levels of behavior problems. And that means that they're more often rejected by peers, their teachers don't spend as much time with them so they do worse in school, they don't get as much positive feedback, and then they carry those behavior problems with them when they enter kindergarten. So preschool children wind up actually being expelled more frequently than school-age children, which raises the huge question to me, where does a preschooler go when they've been expelled? back into the home environment that caused the problem to begin with. I'm not sure that that's the best strategy for us to use. Children who are identified as hard to manage in ages three and four have a 50-50 chance of continuing that uh, behavior problem on into adolescence. And in fact, that uh, connection is so strong that the correlation between preschool appearing aggression and aggression um, at age 10 is higher than the correlation of the stability of IQ. Now, we've always thought that your IQ is pretty stable, right? And in fact, it does have a very high correlation, which is 80%. But the correlation between behavior problems that occur early and behavior problems that occur later on, because we're not doing anything about it, remember only one or two out of every 10 actually receive treatment for those significant behavior problems, then do we expect any different response than that? You've got to do something proactive in order to turn that around. And that's sad because early period aggressive behaviors are our highest predictor of gang membership. So when an aggressive antisocial child is uh, continued with that behavior to age nine, then buckle your seat belts and ride it out because there's little hope for intervention after that point in time because the brain now is becoming less plastic as it moves forward in terms of development. Those, remember that neurons that fire together, wire together? Now we have nine full years of firing together, wiring together in an abnormal way, and how are you going to turn that around with great persistence and effort. It takes much more discipline to, I mean discipline on our part as adults, to change that behavior pattern once a child passes age nine. And yet, did you ever get any training that showed you how to deal with these kids when you were in your uh, teacher education coursework? No. In fact, faculty and preschool programs say that their graduates are probably the least likely to be able to be prepared to deal with significant behavior problems. So in a typical classroom, how many kindergarten teachers are having? Okay, two. <laughs> Our hearts go out to you. <laughs> in a typical kindergarten, 10 children are going to manifest those problem behaviors. And only one is going to get to help. And out of every kindergarten class of 30, seven will go on to second grade with those same behavior problems that they have in kindergarten. And by the way, that continues. Grade after grade, until they do what? Yeah, until they drop out. Until they've established such a pattern of failure in the schools that they drop out. Now that's unfortunate because there are evidence-based strategies that will help us in this regard. So how does trauma actually manifest itself in the classroom? Well, when you see that trauma causes a decrease in the volume of the brain, and it affects those areas that deal with, like the limbic system, that's the emotional side of the brain. Your memory and your behavior controlled by the neocortex, those portions of the brain are significantly impacted. And it also decreases the integration between the right brain and the left brain, between the emotional, you know, uh, simultaneously releasing creative side of your brain and your logical sequential left brain. And it results in an abnormal release of stress hormones that are never self-regulated. 
So that shows up in your classroom in terms of concentration, memory, goal setting, poor relationships, and it distorted what we call inner representation of the world. In me, in, in, what that means is that they develop expectations that things will always be the way that they view the world now. How do you turn that around when the way that you respond to a student can actually become a trigger for a traumatic event that has occurred in their life? So you see poor reading, lower GPA, absences, suspensions, dropouts, the whole sequence. When you boil it right down to it, the impact of trauma affects three areas. It affects attention, it affects regu regulation, which means um, arousal regulation, the regulation of your own stress hormones, and it affects relationships. And all three of those are encased in a single concept, and that's safety. If we can create an environment of safety for these children, it means that there is less likelihood that their stress levels are going to go up. And if the stress levels don't go up, it means you're going to keep them in the neocortex level of operation longer. It means that you're going to have less limbic brain activity going on. So let's take a look at each one of those three areas. Attention. Now, normally when we think of attention, we think in four different areas. You've got focus, the ability to sustain attention over a longer period of time. You've got the ability to retrieve information once it's in there, and then you have what we call inhibitory control, which is the ability to control your impulses, okay? Like jumping out of your seat, or you know, uh, some strange motor movement in some way, or something along that line. Any of you have kids in your classroom that have symptoms like this? Yeah, what's, what's our normal response to kids who have this behavior problem? Medicaid. Medicaid. Why? Does medication help? Yeah, research shows medication helps. Does it help the underlying problem? No. What it does is it increases the release of the feel-good hormones, like dopamine and serotonin, so it keeps the child artificially in that neocortex level, but it doesn't do anything to resolve the underlying trauma. And as soon as the child goes off the medication, all of that resurfaces. So, you're seeing here an inability to attend to more than one request at a time, processing difficulties, poor concentration, negative seeking of attention. Look at this list. Okay? Now, think of that chart that I showed you on how we respond as our brain activity gets pushed further and further down. Which portion of the brain do you think is operational with these kinds of of activities. Is it the neocortex? No. Do you need the neocortex to do most schoolwork? Yes. yes. They're not going to be able to do it. They're not in that level. This is not something that is like genetically imposed. Okay? Although there are some who would say that there is a genetic perhaps predisposition to this kind of behavior. This is caused by an improper release of hormones in the brain that has created neural pathways that are um, contrary to the normal development. I don't like to use the word normal. Uh, that are contrary to the, to the way that the brain was originally designed to work. Let's put that way. So how do you regulate arousal? Well, of course, that ability to focus and sustain attention has to do with our ability to regulate arousal. And to the extent that arousal then affects vigilance, reaction time, information processing, we're going to wind up with an inefficient processing of information. In fact, Kotelaku has said that stress compromises your executive functioning. That's the prefrontal lobe. It compromises it because it diverts cognitive resources away to the task of regulation of arousal. Ruby Payne talked about this in the last session. She said you only have so much energy to expend. If you're having to expend energy just simply trying to control your emotional state, then you have less energy to spend on anything else, mainly learning or sitting still or doing those kinds of activities that are expected in most classrooms. And in the face of that, because you don't have that regulation going on, it's like the guy cutting you off on the freeway. Your stress hormones elevate. At that point, you're out of control. 
Kids who've been exposed to trauma, this happens like that. They don't have a reason for it. It's a, it's a trigger that they can't identify, and it automatically pushes their behavior down into the limbic system, which causes this kind of rational uh, problem. Like, he hit me. That's that. The inability to read cues. Well, he, you know, he accidentally brushed into you. You know, that's the reality of what happened. Remember this chart that I showed you early on? Where is a kid who's operating with that poor arousal and poor attention span, where are they operating? Down here in this toxic level, you see. What we need to do is create environments that push them back up. How do you do that? What's the common element between tolerable and toxic? Protective relationships. Ruby shared with you this morning that the importance of a, of a caring adult, you know, what did she call a good adult from the research out of Ireland? That a good adult in your life, that's huge, the impact that that has on a young child. So a positive teacher-child relationship, that's the way that you develop that. Research is showing that children in classrooms who can point to an adult in a classroom, and they say, that adult truly cares for me. Those children perform at the 76th percentile, I believe. What's grade level, by the way? 50th percentile. Right? Which means that they're performing way above their peers on the basis of that one factor alone. That they have an adult that they can point to, they feel safe in their presence, and they believe that that adult actually truly cares for them. Strife duty is quoted as saying, a protective factor against adverse lifetime events is early placement into stable, loving, and supportive environments. She goes on to say, a protective factor against disruptive school experiences is whether the child connects with someone that they believe truly cares about them. See the importance that you play in a child's life? My son was telling me that um, there is a student that he once had. He's now graduated, he's gone on to Cal Poly, and he's developed his own clothing home, which hip hop folks have kind of taken notice of. They start wearing his clothes in their uh, music videos, and his business is taking off. And he's only in his second year of college. In commenting on his success, he said, I owe all my success to my eighth grade science teacher. He told me, you will never amount to anything. He said, I did this to prove you wrong. You know, that's true. The comment down here in the front is, not every kid is so resilient. Most kids would be devastated by that. The belief that there is an adult in their life who believes that they really are worth fun. Let's resolve to say, by the way, not to be one of these. It really ties in with a quote from Teddy Roosevelt. That no one cares how much you know unless they know how much you care. Or if we put it in the school context, children don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. It's the same thing. They're going to learn so much better when they know that you have positive regard for them. So a number of years ago, there was a study that was done, actually it was in 2008, and they asked people the question to respond to the statement that most people can be trusted. They did this study back in 1960, in which they found that 58% said that most people can be trusted, but in 2008, when they ran the study, only 32% affirmed that statement. What does that say about our society, that our level of trust of those around us has decreased? Well, it says a lot about attachment, folks, because we learn, remember, that sense of trust that adults can be trusted to take care of us. We learn that as very young children. In fact, if we look at the statistics, what we see is that kids are more disconnected nowadays than ever. Children spend about half as much time playing outdoors as they did in the 80s, that children under the age of six spend two hours each day in front of a computer screen. And even babies, half of all babies, use screen media every day. If you don't have eye contact with a mom, how do you know that you're really care being cared for at all? I was um, in a parking lot waiting to uh, participate in a presentation, and a woman ran by me in uh, pushing one of those um, really high-tech, uh, what do they call bobs or something, you know, a really high-tech stroller, and she's all dressed up in her jogging suit, and I mean, she's looking pretty good, everything's coordinated, 
and um, and she's pushing the bob, and she's running, and in the bob is a baby, like, I don't know, maybe it's a year, I have a 13-month-old um, grandchild, and so it's about a similar age, you know, about 13, 15 months old. And the baby also is dressed in a jogging suit that's matching <laughs> all <laughs> It's very cute, you know. And, as, and that's what caught my eye to begin with, was matching jogging suits. And I thought, how adorable. And as they ran by, I noticed the baby is in the bob with mom's phone. And this. I know that my 13-year-old grandchild already knows how to launch Netflix on my iPhone. <laughs> You know, she picks up my phone and she knows exactly how to get to it. And in fact, I've got four grandchildren that live locally, ten all together. And the four that live locally, well, except for the 13-month-old, she's not that smart. But the other three, they already know my password on my phone. You know, yeah. So, so they're very familiar with it. I walked into Target in the return section down there in Apple Valley, and they have screens there, you know, for return. I saw this little girl, maybe three years old, she walks up to the screen and she's doing this. See, she's swiping. It wasn't a touch screen. <laughs> I was watching a mom the other day, she was holding her infant in her arms, you know, and the baby's taking a bottle. Now, when I was raising my kids, uh, and for those of you moms in the room, when you hold a baby, you know, you hold them like this, right? Okay, so I've got the baby here, and so usually it's like, I've got the baby and either I'm holding the bottle like this, right? Or I'm, what am I doing? I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking at the baby. That's normal, right? Here's what mom's doing. She's got her iPhone in her hand. The baby's eating. She's like this. You know, they've done research in hospitals in NICUs on the cortisol level of premature babies. And what they were distressed about was that the cortisol levels were skyrocketing with these babies in the NICU. And so they redirected the nurses and they said, when you go in to check the vitals, make eye contact. And then they check the cortisol levels. You know what happened just with eye contact? Cortisol levels drop like a stone. See, we are hardwired to connect with significant adults from our various earliest times. And when that doesn't happen, it jacks up the stress hormones to a point where it starts the neural network that is circumventing the normal process of cognition and going straight to brainstem activity. We're spending less time in those interactions, which means that we're developing a generation that is going to be characterized, or is characterized, by less empathy, less trust, and less opportunity to connect, and connect to care and connect, because we're giving them less opportunity for gene activation. Neurons that wire together, that fire together, wire together. Um, Karen did a research in which she was able to see the connection that this lack of connectedness with young people now is looking very much like children who've been totally deprived of their mothers during infancy. And we're seeing exactly the same characteristics as they approach school age, which are superficial feelings, the poverty of feelings toward others, the inaccessibility. Remember the rich kid in Chicago? Is that lack of connection for the results, and we're seeing that now as well. So how can we connect? Well, through caring relationships, and of course, I've given you all the bad news, and the fact is, there is hope. To change brain structure, develop new neurons, Bruce Perry pointed out, the matter of frequency, intensity, and the use of repetition is key. Because our sense of safety comes from our relationships with others. So to the extent that we extend and, and build up those relationship connections, then we can help to rewire the brain. Young people regulate their affect in the context of relationships. And the best predictor of child functioning is adult functioning. That's true in the classroom as well. So, the reason why is because when you make connection, you release all these feel-good hormones, okay? Like dopamine and oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone, 
the endorphins that give us our sense of pleasure, all of that is released in that social interaction. Uh, quoting from Hard Heart to Connect, Alan Shore made the statement once again that the human brain is talked into talking and loved into loving. <coughs> Maya Angelou, of course, put it this way. She said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. It's the same thing. Talked into talking and loved into loving, it's because of, it's because of gene activation. We are hardwired to connect. That's the way our brains are designed. So, social environments matter then, because if our goal is self-regulation, then we need to teach children not only to manage aggression, which is at one end of the spectrum, but also anxiety. And we do that by being uh, connected in a supportive relationship with the child. So if you take a look at how the adult is making connection with the child, what's she doing first? She's making eye contact. She has physical touch involved. Do you notice an, an empathetic affect on her face? Remember I said the right brain picks up on all of that. The right brain notices that. We tend to become those that we admire the most. We're hardwired that connection. So when Charles Barkley famously said a few years ago, I'm not a role model, well, sorry Charles, it's not your choice. <laughs> because people will try to emulate those that they admire for good or for ill. And when young children have to respond in homes of trauma to trying to make the parents so that they're not so angry, their body learns how to not be hit. If the parent has parentified the child and put all of their burdens on them, the child grows up learning how to please others by accepting those burdens. That pattern is established very early in life. So what does a caring relationship look like? Well, first of all, you have to acknowledge and identify feelings. It's what Ruby Payne said, you have to validate. So when you are saying to a child, I know you're upset, I can see that this hurts you. You are acknowledging their feelings. It's okay to have their feelings. What does that do? Your behavior winds up communicating a value system to those around you. And children pick up on that, and they start doing what? Starting to emulate those that they admire. So the teacher in the classroom who turned to the young man and said, you will never amount to anything if that was within hearing of anyone else in the classroom, what do you think their attitude toward that young man was? It's the same. The second is be present. By the way, this is ABC. Acknowledge your feelings. Second one is be present. That means that you have to be attentive. You have to look at what the child is communicating by their behavior. That's receiving what the child is trying to express. There is a reason why they're acting the way that they're acting. And the motive, your motive, has to be what? Toward the child. How do we make this better? As opposed toward other things that, quite frankly, the child isn't that concerned about, like keeping classroom control, or other things such as that. Do we have the time as teachers nowadays with 30, 40 kids in the classroom to give this kind of attention? Probably. Which is one of the reasons why we default to that which is expedient. And the third area is we have to create safety. When you're talking about creating safety, it means that you are establishing that relationship with a child and a caring adult so that the child sees adults as those who can actually protect them. That big people take care of little people. That's the way it's supposed to be, as opposed to the other way around, which often occurs in homes of trauma. You build rapport with a child, you never allow bullying in the classroom, and you don't allow put-downs. Folks, you've got to make that a rule. You have to address that every time, even when it's under the breath. You have to create a safe environment in the classroom where a kid's self-esteem is not destroyed by the comments of another, who may ridicule them for the way that they look or some thing that they did awkwardly in the classroom. Understand the trauma triggers and adjust to the environmental context. And I've got 10 minutes to finish this up, so I'm gonna go back to the chart. 
Because when you understand the trauma triggers, then you're also understanding the way that the brain works when you're dealing with trauma triggers. So I'm going to give you this expanded list now. We've got cognitive style, affective calm solution, kind of focus room, teaching style. Here's what happens. Where are we? In the neocortex. In the neocortex, the cognitive style is very abstract and creative. This is when the resources are rich. They're very stable and you're in a safe environment. You can operate in that level where within a safe environment, I'm free to think as broadly as I can. So the affective tone in the classroom at that point becomes calm, or it is calm. We wind up being very innovative in terms of the solutions that we come up with. Our time focus is in the future. And the rules are abstract and conceptual, like be responsible, be respectful, be safe. See, we're all familiar with that because of the work that we've done with positive behavior intervention, but you need to realize the way that that interacts with the way that the child is responding to issues because his brain will only be abstract and conceptual if he's in a calm state. As soon as you get out of that state, then things change. Your environment is nurturing and flexible and enriching, but what happens when the pressure comes in? You have a disruption, a trigger sets a kid off. The first step you go to is you become much more concrete. See? See the notion that we had before? The brain starts operating this way. Our tone now goes from calm to that of that is more anxious. We're anxious to get control. We, our solutions become more simplistic. Our time focus is immediate. Our rules become more intrusive. And our teaching style at that point becomes more ambivalent or obsessive. Why? because the foundation of a calm environment has been shattered and we need to gain control once again in the classroom. And if we're pushed down even further, then we become reactive and aggressive. Terror, reactionary. We're dealing only with the present. Our rules become very restricted and punitive. And our teaching style becomes oppressive or harsh or apathetic. What happens when you have a major event in the classroom? One kid punches another. Did you see the video of the security guard that tackled the girl sitting in her desk? Right? She was sitting in her desk. She was already in a stage that was pushed way down into the brainstem because she was trying to avoid. That's what happens. Avoidance behavior. She was trying to avoid things around her. And he escalated the situation by tackling her in the desk. Where do you think his brain was operating? Yeah, way over here. You see, remember I said that behavior occurs in the context of both the student and the teacher? This affects you both. It's not just the child trauma. When things, events like this happen, you have to be aware of where your own brain is operating as well. And you have to control those triggers because they can result in a loss of safety. So what can trigger a child? What can be things in the environment, sensory input, sight, smells, sounds, touch? It can be things in the physical environment, like a change in the weather, for example. It can be parts of the emotional response, like sudden overwhelming fear or anxiety, that is um, that sense of helpless or helplessness or frustration. It can be triggered by something in the physical environment, like physical self, like being tired or hungry, or activities like getting into a car or going to a certain location. It can be interactions that you see in others, like their emotional display, or maybe misreading the way that their facial expression is doing, their tone of voice on another person's behavior. All of these can be triggers for an emotional response. Here's the thing. Emotional triggers happen on the right brain side. They don't have language. There's no beginning. There's no end. There's no time. They come in snapshots, horrible pictures or sounds that overwhelm the emotions and flood the body with these hormones that get you ready for fight and flight and survival. Primarily adrenaline, because cortisol levels at that point in a child who's been frequently stressed have been suppressed. They've been dampened. They found that in children of trauma, their cortisol levels are actually lower than in normally developing children. And here's the problem with that. Cortisol, while at first gets you ready to be responsive to stress, it also sends the all clear signal to your adrenal gland saying, threat's over, we can calm down. What happens if you have a reduced cortisol level? You don't calm down, not for an extended period of time. Ruby talked about how maybe drinking a glass of water would help 
for a child to come down to think of the brain. How does that work? Now you've got two choices. If everything's happening at the limbic level, you can either regulate that from the top down, meaning from the neural cortex down, which we already have shown you is probably not so effective, or from the <coughs> bottom up. From the bottom up, from the brain stem up, how do you regulate behavior? What is the brain stem control? Breathing. Deep breaths. Concentrating on the breath. Six a minute. Slowly breathing in, breathing out. It helps to bring the body back into balance. Movement. Ruby should movement. Movement is another big one. If you see the sports team on the sideline, they're stressed out because they lost the game. What do they do? What do you see? Their, their movement doing. Head down, and then what? Hands on the top of the head. This, this. What are they doing to themselves? Deep pressure. Deep pressure, touch. That helps to regulate the body. They found a normal, natural way that is socially acceptable to do that. Kids in the classroom, when they get up out of their seat and they walk around, we'd say, what, sit down. You know, we need to give them the opportunity to do large muscle movement, to get up and to walk around because they're regulating and they're regulating from the bottom up. See, if you want self-regulation, you have to create some opportunities in the classroom to be able to do that. So I'm going to run you through a quick scenario to show you how this works. This was developed by Joyce Garado out of the University of California in San Francisco. And probably a typical scenario that we would expect to see in a classroom. Ryan is a third grade boy. This morning when he arrived at school, his teacher asked him for his homework, and Ryan did not have it. She expressed frustration, and she took away his recess as a consequence. A short time later, his desk mate accidentally bumped Ryan. Ryan punched him in the stomach. His teacher, upset by this outburst, began to yell to Ryan to stop. Ryan began to scream. He kicked chairs and he hid underneath his desk. After 10 minutes of trying to get Ryan out from under the desk, he was brought to the principal's office and given a five-day suspension for fighting and disrupting behavior. Does that sound anywhere close to something that perhaps you've experienced? All right, did the teacher handle that well? Let's look at it through a trauma lens. Ryan is a third grade boy from a highly under-resourced neighborhood. He's been witnessing severe domestic violence between his parents since he was a baby. One night, in front of Ryan, his father beat up and injured his mother so badly that a neighbor called the police. His father was handcuffed and taken away by the police, and his mother was taken in an ambulance to the hospital. Ryan slept little that night, terrified and anxious what would happen to his father and his mother. In the morning, Ryan's neighbor took him to school. This morning when he arrived at school, his teacher, who did not know about Ryan's traumatic experience, and we never do, by the way, asked him for his homework. When he didn't have it, she expressed frustration and took away his recess as a consequence. Ryan was upset and triggered by being in trouble with his teacher. A short time later, his desk mate accidentally bumped Ryan, already triggered to some degree into a heightened state of vigilance, meaning that he was where in the survival brain down in the lower brain, the midbrain, and the brain stem, this physical contact fully triggered Ryan into a fight or flight reaction. He punched his desk mate in the stomach. His teacher, upset by this outburst, began to yell at Ryan to stop, which further escalated Ryan. He began to scream, kick chairs, and hide under his desk. After 10 minutes of trying to get Ryan out from under the desk, during which time the teacher felt helpless and defeated, and the other children looked on in fear and frustration. Ryan was brought to the principal's office and given a five-day suspension for fighting and disruptive behavior, inadvertently exposing Ryan not only to a major loss of instructional time, but also to a period of time during which he would have no refuge from the trauma and suffering in his home life. Does that paint a different picture of this kid? Is this a plausible scenario? <coughs> yeah, as the, actuality, the actuality is it happens, folks, all the time. Being trauma-informed in the classroom doesn't mean that we go out and assess every kid who suffered trauma and then send them to some special place. Being trauma-informed means that you actually think more deeply about what could be causing the behavior rather than respond always with suspension or a reactive form of discipline. 
that we are proactive and preventive. <laughs> Using physical proximity, the arrangement of desks, you know, and those kinds of things to restore safety to a, a student so that even if they are triggered, and we don't, we can't control the triggers, folks, we can't control this. But even if they are triggered, we have a plan in place that will help to bring them back to a point of safety as quickly as possible. That's what being trauma-informed looks like. If you have a resource-rich classroom in a resource-rich school, then all children will be able to learn in a safe and, and enriching environment, and they'll get the most out of their instruction. I know you do a great job with this. I'm hoping that this presentation kind of opened your eyes to a different angle on the classroom problems that you face every day. Thank you so much.